Hello everybody, uh, Ollie here. I just wanted to pop in now at 5 to 12 to let you know that at midday we're going to be live with Fran Gibbons, Francesca Gibbons. She's a children's author. Uh, so if you're interested in books, you're going to want to listen. More than books. I mean, writing. How you get published. All of those things. All very exciting. Join us from midday. We will be here. See you in a moment.
you is down. Hope you're all having a lovely. Calm down, calm down. Hope you're having a lovely afternoon. It is Intertrash Chat, of course, where we talk to interesting people uh, because we can on the internet because we're all hiding at home, not doing much else. And today I'm very excited actually because I've been talking about it for some time. Uh, we are talking to. I will ask if it's okay to say this. Children's author, Fran Gibbons. Who is here? Fran, there she is. Hey. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Why, why yeah. do you think you might not be allowed to say that? Are you not allowed to say my full name or that I'm an author? Well, no, I've, um, oh, uh, hang on a minute. What have we got? Mini, Mini Hood, hi. Hi, Mini Hood said hi already this morning. Um, no, no, I just wondered because, um, you you might take offence to it. Are they, are they children? Are they children's books? Are they children's books? Yeah, they are children's books. Okay, well, we'll go into detail in, in, in that in a minute. I'm going to just say uh, I know Fran from peri- previous existence as a content bod at an outdoor shop called Cotswold Outdoor, and you were a something marketing bod, email bod, email bod. I do you know what? I didn't even really know what you used to do. No, I don't think I did either. <laughs> you must have you must have had a little bit of an inkling as to what you did. <laughs> no, I think I was the I was the email bod, but I was desperate to be the copy bod, so um I was doing what I could to become the copywriter. That's fair enough. I mean copywriting does seem to be a lot of people's first sort of steps into writing. But that 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 like that aside for the minute, because we don't want to talk about copywriting jobs and writing emails, promotional emails for an outdoor company. What we really want to talk about is the fact that you are now a fully fledged children's author. Or I'm going to say almost because you haven't got anything published yet. Is that right? Yeah, I feel like a bit of a fraud. I've, I've been living this authory existence, but actually have nothing you can buy in a shop yet. So yeah, but okay, okay. Let let's start from uh, let's start from the beginning then. So like, uh, what what happened was a I can't remember exactly when it was, but I saw on Fran's Facebook page that uh, she landed some major book deal. It like it looked really major. I was like, wow, this is really exciting. Well done. This is brilliant news. And I was like, what the hell? How does that ha- how does that even happen? How do you do that? I mean, I've tried writing a book in the past, and it's basically still a Google Doc with nothing on it. Um, <laughs> So, take, right, right, take me right to the beginning. What is the book about, and how did you start it? Right to the beginning. Uh, yeah, come on. Okay, so I, I actually did write the first draft of it when I was 12, so that is quite a long time ago. Um, <laughs> but I guess I've, all, I've always written stuff, um, and I really liked the one that I wrote when I was 12. I remembered it again when I was in my early 20s and thought, oh, maybe there's something in that. So I went back to it and rewrote it throughout most of my 20s, but um, didn't massively think I'd get published. Obviously, I wanted to. I was like, yeah, that's a pipe dream. That's not going to happen. But the more I worked on it and the more confident I got in it, the more I started talking to people about it. And I think that was one of the big breakthroughs was sort of, yeah, being confident enough to tell pretty much anyone I could meet, oh, yeah, I'm doing this thing. Uh, and eventually I told someone who said, oh, I know someone who works in publishing. Um, they might have a look at it for you and give some feedback. It was my uh, colleague at my last job, actually. Um, so he sent off part of my manuscript to his friend who worked in publishing, and I was expecting a few lines back of feedback, and I was so excited every day driving to it, like, oh, I wonder if I'll get a few lines of feedback today. Uh and then eventually he offered me a book deal. So that, that, does, that does sound a little bit crazy. You think when people yeah. uh, want to get a, a book deal or uh, get published, they'll send their manuscript off and it'll, they basically won't get a response, you know. Uh, but it sounds yeah. like it wasn't fully unsolicited if the guy knew knew who it was. But uh, I, when you, so you wrote, you wrote the first draft when you were 12. When you went back, firstly, did you write on a computer or was it handwritten? Oh, I did have a had an electric typewriter. No, that's Pretty fancy. Cool. Yeah. yeah, fancy pants. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I think I wrote it partially on the electric typewriter and partially by hand. But I've I have lost that first draft, which is a good thing. <laughs> You've lost it, did you say? Yeah. Right. 
But what was it like when you went back to it, though? Were you, were you just like, oh, God, I was terrible. That was awful. Or was it like, was it pretty coherent? Were you like, this is quite good? No, I reckon because I, lo I lost the manuscript, I think that was key to me writing it again. I think if I'd actually read the manuscript, I'd be like, oh, this oh, I is see. shit. Yeah, it was okay. just the, the idea of, it was about um, a garden that we used to go to when I was a kid uh, that was completely overgrown and going to rack and ruin. And at the time, I sort of imagined... Oh, what if you found a door in a tree and it went to another world? And when I was 12, that seemed like the most original idea ever. Um, yeah. But I, I thought, oh, I'll give that story a, a go again. I reckon if I'd found the manuscript, it would have put me off because I would have been like, yeah, that's shit. <laughs> <laughs> but did you... Um... When, so when you picked it up when you were 20 or in your 20s, were you writing other stuff at that time as well? Was it, were, were, did you have like multiple things on the go? Or, or what, what, what sort of drove you to pick it up again? What was the driving force behind that? Um, I think just a sense of restlessness. Uh, hard to say exactly what. I, I changed, as you may or may not remember, I changed jobs fairly quickly throughout my 20s. Um, which isn't so unusual anymore, but I definitely felt restless at work. Uh, and I was trying to work out why. And I, I just remember being on holiday one day being like, this is not what I want to do for the rest of eternity. And then being like, I used to write. I kind of missed that. But I, yeah, I didn't write really from between the ages of about 16 to 22, roughly. So I, yeah, just popped into my head as an alternative to working. <laughs> Which is always good. Everybody's always trying to look, find an alternative to working. But you were working, which means that you, will simul you were simultaneously working a full-time job and writing this book. So what was the process? Did you, how, how strict were you with yourself in that? Did you get home, chill for a bit, and then you were like, right, between the hours of six and seven, I'm going to write? Or were you like, oh, it's a Tuesday evening. I fancy it. So I think for quite a few years, I was just writing on holiday um, or weekends. Um, I joined a writer's group and that sort of helped me take it a bit more seriously. And then there was one year when, when I was like, oh, this might be worth giving some proper time to. I started waking up early, or early for me, maybe not early for you, but early for me before work and doing an hour before work every day. And actually I found that really helpful um even though i'm not a morning person that was like that was when my brain was the most awake mm. uh, and that's how i wrote about half of the book was just in an hour every day before work uh yeah that was good yeah no that's uh it, it's interesting yeah i find that m myself in the morning like you say my brain is just slight slightly more switched on particularly creatively i don't know for some reason maybe it's because i'm slightly sleepy <laughs> My brain sort of ventures into a slightly dreamy space sometimes early in the morning, uh, first thing. But still, that's quite a feat to get up, write for an hour, then head off to work and do it. Um, but... Yeah, but it was great. I loved it. It was the best hour of the day. It, <laughs> yeah. But I think you're right. It's that sleepy, it's that half asleep feeling that's actually really good. And I used to love being sort of, it's, it's being really relaxed as well, I think, when you first wake up. I think that's really helpful for creativity and uh, in some ways, I'm jealous of my old self. I wish I could get back to that, waking up being like, oh, half asleep, this is the best, because it's such a precious time when you've got to go to work, and now I've got all day. <laughs> well, ha have you now then? So what, what position are you in now? So you, land you landed the book deal. No, hang on. It wasn't just a book deal, was it? It was a multi-book deal. Is that right? Have I got that right? Yeah, I signed for a trilogy, so that means I need to write two more. <laughs> right. So they, they, this is what I find quite baffling about it because it, like, I mean, not baffling, but you have exciting is the word I'm looking for, but you have, uh, you'd written a book, uh, which the publisher obviously got very excited about and loved. And then off the back of that, bearing in mind, you're an unproven author so far, mm -hmm. they were like, we want you to write two more books. So it must have been fucking amazing <laughs> like the book must have been so good and so well written for them to do that because i mean to take that kind of punt how did that conversation go what did they were they like oh we don't want to just offer you one book deal not two but three like how did it how did it work it was such a good day <laughs> <laughs> I went to London because I live in West Oxfordshire, so London feels like a long way away. So I got the train in like with my backpack 
uh, for a meeting with the guy who's now my editor. Um, and I didn't really know what kind of meeting I was going to. I wasn't sure if it was like I was going to get feedback. So I was like preparing my um, like responses in my head or whether, yeah, he was going to say, oh, maybe we could offer you a book deal. I did, just didn't know what to expect. Don't know the publishing world at all. Um, and then when I got there, I met him in the, sh the Shard or next to the Shard where the HarperCollins offices are. So it was felt so glamorous. Um, and he said, oh, yeah, we, what, would you, do you reckon you'd be able to write more of them? I was like, uh, yes. <laughs> did you, yeah, but did you know that? Were you just like, I'm just going to say yes? <laughs> anything. I will write anything. Um, no, I don't, I don't even know because the whole idea of having a book deal felt like such a fantasy at that point. Uh, I think I probably would have agreed to most things. Do you regret it now? I mean, you're not. That's such a stupid question because, of course, you don't. That, so, what, what, what does your, how does your day shape up now then? Because I, I, I don't think you can see it at home, but when I called Fran, she's got some post-it notes on her wall just to the left-hand side. So, are you now? You've got these deadlines. How is it? Has it taken some of the magic away from writing before when you had those hour in the morning before work? Do you find that? <laughs> Yes, I think the first um, the first sort of three quarters of book two that I wrote was I really enjoyed it and it was a similar feeling, maybe even better because I had it all day to do it and I could just go do what I want in the afternoon, like meet a friend or go for a really long walk. Uh, but now the deadline is approaching and I still have a quarter of the book to go. I don't think magic is the word that springs to mind. <laughs> Yeah, but do you? I mean, I I find when I when I write, have an article to write and I'm on a deadline though, I'm I'm awful. I tend to push right up to the deadline, and I I can sometimes like I find it must be different with a book because if I'm writing about a specific topic, mm -hmm. I'll start thinking about it and I'll let it sort of mull in my brain subconsciously for a while, and then I'll get to literally sort of a day before the deadline, and then I'll knock out 800 words in about 40 minutes, and you just sort of. But it's been mulling. I know it's been mulling up there, so I push it right up to that deadline. But I I wouldn't even know where to start with the process of writing a book. So how like from how do you do it? How do you structure that from from the start? So bearing in mind someone and how long do they give you to write a book? I mean, how the hell do they work that out? How long do you get? I know some authors who seem to just have. Like the shortest I've come across so far is a couple of months. Yeah, no, that's awful. Uh, which is really quick, but I, I think some of those authors are writing shorter books. Uh, but I've been given a year, which I think is actually really reasonable. And you've got how long have you got left? Uh, a month and a half. And you've got a quarter to go. <laughs> Shut up, Molly. <laughs> No, no. Better start. I don't try not to work out the weeks left. Oh, well, talk to me about talk to me about that process then, though, because I think I find this interesting as well. Because if you're taking that leap from uh, amateur writer to professional, as you now are, you mm -hmm. like you said you were writing hour for you know for an hour at the start of the day, and there's very little. I, I don't know how you structured your story. If an idea just came to your head and you just thought, oh, I'm going to write about it, but do you find how do you approach it now? I mean. Did you, when you first started writing, have post-it notes on your wall? Or is that a new development? Are you trying to storyboard the whole thing and then sort of write around that? What's your, how do you do it? Uh, I'm not big on planning. Uh, I know some writers have huge spreadsheets before they get going and then they just follow them. And I'm kind of jealous of that because I think I must be so reassuring, like a safety net. Every day you sit down, you know what you're going to do. Uh, so I don't do that. The post-it notes are normally after what when I've written something. So I will try to sort of summarize each chapter to myself so I can have a bird's eye view of what's gone on. Um, but I find planning ahead, I don't know how people do that because I don't really have any ideas until I sit down to write. And then when I make myself write, I can kind of work out what's going to happen. But I think the biggest difference between book one and book two is when you've got all the time in the world, you've got loads of time to write the wrong thing. And now, yeah. and I think I spent a lot of time writing the wrong story and then deleting it and then trying something else out. And now I'm like, I haven't got time. I haven't got time to write the wrong plot, uh, which I have. That's I have to do that. <laughs> but does it, it is it different now because 
you have an editor, like you say, I mean, how much do the publisher sort of assist you in that kind of thing? And how often are you sending the manuscripts? Is it quite a sort of regular contact or are they like, yeah, see you in 12 months? More the latter. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, um, I think because they're so short of time, the editors, they don't really want to, and quite rightly, I don't think they want to see anything until you've got a finished manuscript. Oh. as good as you can make. Uh, so you froze yeah. briefly then but you're back now don't worry the technological demons were firing themselves into life uh sorry but you were saying go on please go on uh yeah i think editors don't really want to see anything i think quite rightly until you've got it as good as you can get it so they won't see a work in progress i don't think i mean i'm new to this but i don't think they'll see a work in progress i think my editor wants to see it when it's when I've got it as good as I can get it and I'll hand it in thinking this is the best hopefully no more work needed and then he'll come back with a load of edits and I'll be like okay more work needed <laughs> what, what's the I'm just gonna say hello to a few people Jessamy has got in touch as well movie man 175 hey I think you're a new viewer, viewer movie man on YouTube hello um nice to have you along uh, we are speaking to Fran Gibbons, by the way, who is a children's author, who's landed a multi-book deal uh, and is, as of today, an unknown author because she hasn't been published yet, but she will be and you will know her name. Um, yeah, Jessamy said, a year for book two, how long did book one take? Well, I think we know that. You started writing it when you were 12 and you are now... I'm not sure. <laughs> when, did, when did you finish it? I, I think you can't really count the, the version when I was 12 because it was quite shit, but I am... <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, but I, it it's taken me about eight years of actually of being a grown-up writing to do book one. Mm. I think that's why a year suddenly feels not very long. And um, she also says, do you know what will happen in the second two books? But before you answer that, actually, give me... Give me the premise of the of the first book, or or just or the trilogy as a whole, as much as you can. I don't know what you can, how much you can say about it. I think I can say everything. Uh, I won't <laughs> because that would take a long time, and you'd all be asleep. But it's it's. Um, it's a good it's, sell there, Fran. <laughs> I must, must get better at this. No, no, no. Yeah, you're supposed to say, oh, "I'm not going to tell you because it will keep you awake all night. It's really oh, exciting." Yeah. Not, I'm going to tell you about my book, but nah, it will send you to sleep. I'm not even going to bother. <laughs> You've got to get better at the sell. No, yeah. you're right. I do need to get better at that. It's um, it's the so book one is about a little girl who follows a moth through a bit Alice in Wonderland esque through a door in a tree, um, and she gets trapped there. But the the twist is she doesn't realise her little sister, who she doesn't really get on with, has followed her as well. So it's kind of about their relationship as they're as they're on their adventures to get home. It's also about learning. Uh, to leave a little bit of room for your little sisters, not too much, but a little bit. Right. And how much, how much, I mean, you mentioned before that a little bit was sort of based on your experiences, but how much of that now are you sort of tying into it? Are you trying, when you, when you, cause you, you know, you're referring back to a story that you'd started writing when you were 12 or you finished writing when you were 12, but if you're writing a children's story in that way, are you looking back at, are you trying to sort of looking back at your old memories or are you just using your uh new experiences or like your I adult it, experiences i think so many of yeah my adult experiences have sort of wriggled into it uh more than i realized when i was writing it at the time i might have thought i was writing about uh things that happened as a 12 year old but even things like i was getting married at the <laughs> at the time when i was finishing book one and there is a wedding that goes turns into a massive fire spoiler uh in book is one. that a spoiler is that a big spoiler <laughs> <laughs> oh christ we've ruined it we've ruined the book oh, it's not even out know. yet you know, you know it's not I even mean. in the printers <laughs> it's been ruined um but yeah sorry yeah but there was things like weird feelings about weddings that i think made their way into that book that i didn't realize at the time but i think that must be what happens to a lot of people when they're writing you can't help that your every day kind of makes its way into it it's not well, you say that I've... I should add it's the baddies get married so it's hope it's not romance 
<laughs> but but you you say that, but I've always wondered that, particularly with. I mean, this is this is a, a fantasy novel, right? Would, is that the right phrase? It's yeah. yeah but I've wondered that writing those kinds of books, if you do, you know, I mean, writing from experience is obviously the best way to do it. I mean, I that is basically that is literally all I do. Um, but when you're creating a fantasy world like that, I've often wondered if you. You just do it for pure escapism. So it's like, do you know what? I don't want to relive my at the moment because it's just everything's a bit shit. I want to go into this world that I've created. You know, mm -hmm. I think of like Harry Potter and I think of like uh, Lord of the Rings, all of those kinds of things where yeah. they've just sort of created this completely fictitious world where almost anything is possible. And I wondered yeah. if it was like just an escapism for you or. Yeah, so, uh, I think that's a really good point. I think I thought it. I do. I hope it's escapism. I hope it's escapism for people who read it, because that's essentially what I really love in books. Um, and I definitely, it was a kind of escapism from uh, nothing so terrible happening, just boredom, I reckon. Um, but you don't, I think I didn't realise, even like little phrases and things that people say in boring life get into it. And I think... Also for fantasy writing, in my really limited experience of it, I kind of think there's a weird parallel with travel writing. Because um, it is a kind of travel to half visited places. And I was visiting the Czech Republic a lot in my 20s because my husband is Czech. So we we're going out to see his friends and family. Um, and definitely some of the like stories and myths and things that I encountered on my travels have have made their way into the book so obviously some of that's conscious but it is funny looking back at it now and realizing oh yeah i wonder if that was about this person we met or yeah that, <laughs> yeah that's interesting because i think when you're creating an imaginary world you not often think particularly if there's sort of magic involved or just weird creatures or characters do you not think i can't get away with this <laughs> no one's good. Do, do you know what I mean? It's sort of, there has to be, well, does there? I, I, I suppose that's my question. It, it, there has to be a level of believability or is that just the, mm. what the character's about and, and, and the strength of the character? I mean, could the character be a fucking talking carrot or whatever, but it wouldn't <laughs> matter so long as the talking carrot had a good backstory. How did you know? That's book two. It's all about talking vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know what I you know what I mean. I do know what you mean. I guess you have to have rules of the world that you have created to make it believable. So if you're going to do away with gravity, for example, I haven't done that. But if you're going to do away with gravity, you need to really understand what that will mean for how the characters interact with each other and and stick to those rules. I guess there's that. But I think you just know if you believe it yourself as you're writing it and as you edit it, and that's partially why I would feel a bit panicky if this gets right up to the line, I will definitely have a massive panic attack because I find the editing process is when I can step back from it and be like, hmm, do I believe myself? Is anyone going to believe this talking carrot? Uh, and then I find the more I edit it, the more it believable it becomes to me and I just hope that other people are tricked as well. Uh, <laughs> your lovely partner has helpfully put a link to the Waterstones page where it's, <laughs> due, <laughs> where it's due to be uh released which is very exciting and it is called a clock of stars the shadow moth yeah is that the, is that the so w w explain that then is the is that part of the whole series will it be like a clock of stars and then a different title or is it like the trilogy is called a clock of stars Right, okay. Mm. And then, so they will have different titles. I think with that on the cover, so I think most people will probably know it as A Clock of Stars, which is fine. I can't believe he's done that. It's like the embarrassing parent. Hey, well, look, it's, he's just showing his support. I bet he's well chuffed. I bet he really is. Uh, Jessamy said, oh, my God, it's Chris Riddle illustrating yeah, it. Yeah, Chris Riddle, he's amazing. Is yeah. he... Did you choose him to... How much of a say did you get in the illustration? Um... He was definitely mentioned to me before he was contacted, but I don't know. I mean, first of all, I'd be mental to be like, no, I don't want to work with Chris Riddell, because in the illustration world, Chris Riddell is a big deal. Um, 
so I would never have said no. But actually, he was the, basically the only illustrator I knew before I got the publishing deal because my uh, my sister's into illustration and art, and she'd mentioned him to me and said, "Oh, you should follow him on Instagram." Um, but yeah, it, that a lot of those decisions are made by the publisher. But I think if I'd said if if they'd been like, "Oh, we're gonna get," oh, I don't know. I don't know any other illustrations. That's really bad. Uh, uh, Quentin Blake, I think, is about the only one I know. So, but I mean, he I'm not sure. Is he dead? I, 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 I imagine so. There's because probably you know, some. Uh, and get him to illustrate your books. Yeah, there's probably some uh, online <laughs> algorithm that would create Quentin Blake ex illustrations if yeah. you code it rightly. Um, but that's fantastic. It's great, and the illustration is amazing. Actually, it looks it looks awesome. Uh, Movie Man One Seven Five just says a clock of stars. Yes, that is what it's called. Um, when when can we when can we expect book one then? When will it be out? And are you going to be? Have you been told that look, you're going to be a big deal now? So <laughs> you're gonna. Uh, Quentin Blake's not dead apparently. Uh, okay. which is, so sorry, we're saying Quentin. Quentin Blake. Sorry, Quentin. Uh, world renowned or to be world renowned author Francesca Gibbons thinks you're dead. Uh, that's good of her. <laughs> she does, she doesn't. That was my fault. That was my fault. Um, yeah, I mean, have you been told? Look, yeah, we want you to go here, there, and everywhere. Book signing and those kinds of things. Is that being kept from you? Are they not? Because surely that's part of it. If you're releasing a book, they want the author out and about promoting it and doing reading circles or whatever. Reading circles. Yeah, you know, like you, you read to kids. I mean, you'll have to be socially yeah. distanced from them, of course, because they literally just carry every single germ under the sun. But, but... Yeah, even without coronavirus, we're like, stay back. Yes, exactly. Stay away, kids. But read my book. Yeah. What... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, no. Have you have been told anything about that kind of stuff? Is that on the horizon? Um, I think pre-coronavirus world, it was definitely. I think I was gonna travel around the country, talking to children. I mean, that's about that's the limits of my understanding of what a book launch is, really. But I think it's quite an events-based industry, so I don't really know uh, how coronavirus is gonna affect that. We'll see. But yeah, it's out on the 1st of October. I'm definitely going to go to a bookshop and stare at it in Waterstones. But that's about as far as I've got with planning. Well, I, I, Movie Man on YouTube said, take it easy, she's an upcoming writer. I think, I might be wrong, but I think that's hinting at me saying, you know, you're going to be going on tour and that kind of thing. I don't think we should underestimate the fact that as, as an author that hasn't had a book published, you landed a multi-book deal. I think that doesn't happen often, does it? That's not something I think that happens. It I think it does. Um, I think it's. I think, especially in kids' books, it's probably quite common. I think maybe to sign for a series because that's how children consume consume content. That sounds really horrible, doesn't it? But, yes. Um, that's yeah. your marketing background. <laughs> oh God, that hor ah, mm. um, Yeah, I don't think that is necessarily such a big deal obviously i'm really excited about it uh but there are loads of authors who are signed for multi-book deals i think especially for kids oh that's interesting yeah, there See? Have been a book tour. i don't know if there will be a book tour anymore it depends how much everybody is full of covid juice in october yeah that's true i mean actually it's been quite good for you isn't it um covid i would imagine because you're locked down you've got no choice you can't go anywhere so you've got to focus on your writing how have you found it i found it really good for a few months i was like ah oh, i can be really anti-social now just focus on my book uh yeah. and then i started going crazy yeah you should have spoken to me a few months ago you would have got a better version of fran <laughs> why are you, are you genuinely then so are you finding it a little bit a little bit difficult now then is it sort of getting you a bit yeah i i, I mean crazy is not the right word but it's definitely it's definitely having a negative impact on my writing now i would say because there's no breaks from it so it just feels like feel it feels like i should be writing at all times which obviously is not how anything works uh i think especially writing a lot of people seem to do it for a few hours a day um like four hours a day seems to be quite a common stint of writing but when you have a Dead, I'm finding it hard anyway with the deadline to be like, now you should stop and do something else. 
And because, like we were saying, so many things that you're writing get stolen from everyday life, when everyday life is like me and the cat, that's actually a really boring book. Mm. It's it, it, it's interesting because it's one of the one of the few professions I think I can't think of many others where the way to to do it that it is is almost different for everybody. You can go online and search, you know, best way to write a book, how to write a book, and people will have different approaches. You know, when, when it comes to article writing, I I know people that will go, I'll write a hundred words and then I'll step away for fifteen minutes and or i will i will not leave my computer until i've written this that and the other and it don't it doesn't matter what it takes and there's no sort of set methodology ever mm-hmm. and I, and i just i mean how strict are you with yourself because i i do not just go do you know what i've done 10 minutes today and fuck it i know i'm not going to write <laughs> but do you know what i mean because i'm not i'm not i'm not going to write anything better i might just write something that's complete trash i'm just going to go for a walk for the rest of the day because that guilt that you were talking about before, mm-hmm. where you feel like you've got to sit and just constantly work all the time, that that's really, that's debilitating and gnawing. I hate that. Yeah, that's, it is, I'm not going to lie, it is getting problematic. And I think, I hope that in the future, I will have written more books and know how to handle that. But I think I'm quite an anxious person anyway. So I think it's that, um, I think I mentioned when I sent you some notes earlier that what I call the Mr. Toad complex Uh, because my husband says I'm like Mr. Toad which is the best compliment he's ever given me what a quality husband yeah I know we all know that Mr. Toad is yeah everyone's ideal woman Um, but that feeling of like one minute like I'm the best writer in the world this is great and then the next minute oh my God, what am I going to do? I need to delete it all. Um, And I think balancing those, I think a a lot of writers, I don't know, but I'm guessing a lot of writers probably have those two voices. And I think the closer I get to deadline, the more the, oh my God, what are you doing voice is winning. And that is, yeah, I haven't figured out how how to beat that yet. So... I let you know when I know. <laughs> well, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a set answer. I think you just, no. you know, it's one of those things, isn't it? Um, Dave Haffenden, what a duo! <gasps> <laughs> yes, what a duo! Uh, Movie Man One Seven Five is chipping in a lot. Says so she's awesome, but he's also said that I look like I'm losing my hair. Do I? I oh, I can't see properly. You're, you're masking it well with the headphones. Yeah. If you've got yeah. a bald patch like this, I think it's not. I haven't got a bald patch at the back. It's growing nicely, but I, I'm. I've decided. I've. I've made this decision that I'm not going to get a haircut until there's a vaccine. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think it's a nice visual symbol of time uh, the time it's taken to get a vaccine. So when when we get a vaccine, I'll say to people, Look, I haven't had my haircut since. It all started until now when we got the vaccine. That's how long it takes to create a vaccine. That's. Are you going to keep the hair that you get cut off? Well, I could donate it, couldn't I? If it's a certain length, can't you donate it for like wigs for cancer and things, can't you? Don't laugh. It's not funny. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's totally true. What are the restrictions on that kind of thing? What do you mean do they have restrictions on it? I mean, I'm sure somebody will want some lovely blonde locks. Oh my fucking Christ, she's laughing at this. Unbelievable. You know. Uh, I'm doing the same and I don't think I'm going to donate mine. I don't think I'll accept it either. So yeah, we can make a museum of lockdown hair that no one ever visits. I would not go no. without a mask. Um, No, let's go back to books because it's interesting on the books. When you, you're, you're still in book two, how what what will they give you for book three are they like right um you've done book two well done we've signed it off get going on book three or is there a do you have like a gap i mean when have they given you like sort of anticipated release dates for them or yeah i i think i think we're aiming for the same date next year so the idea will be the first one comes out on first of october second one first of october the year after and same for the third one um but yeah, there'll be na- I think there'll be natural breaks because when I hand over the first draft of the manuscript to my editor, he will presumably need some time to read that and come back with feedback. So my plan is 
hand it over to him on time and then take a break. Do you know if you're going head to head with any other well-known authors? I mean, I don't, is it oh, the yeah. same as movies where they sort of release books at a specific time because that's a good time to release a book? Uh, I think there are, there seem to be, I mean, I don't really know is the honest answer, but there seem to be sort of set days throughout the year when a lot of books get released. So I'm sure there are loads and loads of authors who are actually already published, <laughs> getting published again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm trying not to look at that too much. No, I, I don't. Right book. <laughs> It's it's weird, isn't it? I'm just trying to think of examples of a an, an unheard of author that I've sort of come across, but maybe it's just it's way more common, like you say, in in um, in children's literature. I'm not sure. I mean, what what um, what kind of age group is it aimed at? Your books are they like? Is it really young kids? Or is it is it teenagers? What? Oh, I think they're marketing it at nine to twelve year olds, but I will take whatever I can get. <laughs> Well, do, yeah, but do you think it could, would it would the story translate to adults as well? Do you think? Uh, most of the people who've read it so far have been my friends throughout our twenties. Mm. So most people who've read it have been twenty-something-year-old women. Uh, but they're biased; they have to say they like it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, have you had have you had anyone, or have you given it to anyone from a neutral position, and they've come back with feedback and? that's not been what you wanted to hear necessarily um yes is the answer <laughs> how do you cope with it how do you cope with that because it's um, never nice is it hearing something you don't want to hear on something you've worked so hard on at the time it's not nice but um i think the work like the most painful feedback has been the most useful uh because it's actually made me change it that's where i think the writing group's been really handy it's just a local west Oxfordshire writing group but they everyone is there to give feedback on each other's work and they do it really constructively um but i think that's that's that really helped me improve over the last few years i reckon it helps you look at it critically in a way that a friend or family member um don't yeah <laughs> Was it? Um, was there any bitterness in your writing group that you got a deal? I don't think so. There are there are other people in the writing group who've got deals. Um, Kat, she writes for young adults, and her book came out recently, her debut, and I think she's working on another one now as well. So there are other people, but no, no, it's just that, a really supportive group. That's good. <laughs> That's very good. And actually, I think people will want to know what this group is because you all seem to be getting published, which is amazing. <laughs> uh, it's called West Oxfordshire Writers and we're on the internet, so you can join us if you want. I, I won't, but yeah. I <laughs> well, you're out because I know you're not in West Oxfordshire. So we'll I'm not in you. West Oxfordshire. Do you have to exclusively be from West Oxfordshire to join this group? I, I don't know because no one, no one has tried to break in from... Where are, you, where are you living? Dorset. Dorset now, yeah. No one has tried to break in from the foreign lands of Dorset yet. So well, we're, that bridge. We, we've got, you know, we've got our well-known authors here in Dorset. I mean, most of them are dead. Tom Hardy, of course, is from here. Oh, yeah, I like him. Do you? What's your favourite Tom Hardy novel story? Oh, I don't know. I don't remember. Yeah. They all blur into one. I remember studying <laughs> him. And I was like, yeah, he's good. Yeah. I mean, he's got some woman problems, but good writer. Sure. Do you have Do you have favourite books then? What I mean, what did you read when you were growing up? And has any of that sort of inspired what you do now? Um. Yes. Victorian children's literature. Oh. Uh, As in what? You love that? Yes. I don't think there was, I mean, you're maybe a similar age to me. I don't feel like there was so many children's books when we were growing up, but maybe that was just in our house. But my favourite was Peter Pan, so I'm, I'm aware that, that some of that has seeped in, in all its problematic glory. Yeah. And but, Narnia. No, you're right. I, I, I mean, when I was growing up, it was basically Roald Dahl books and Swallows mm. and Amazons and the railway children and that was about it that's yeah. all i sort of remember from that sort of you know we didn't have things like harry potter i don't suppose I, i'm trying to think when that came out and how old i would have been no but but with victorian writing then so have you, is it 
and those kinds of stories has influenced it quite a lot your what you're what you're putting out yeah i'm aware that books that i read as a kid and sort of the narnia books of the obvious portal fantasy um are there as an inspiration i don't know if i can say that it's wriggled in because that would be quite a claim to say that i've written like c.s lewis <laughs> <laughs> you can make that you can make that claim it's fine do it yeah but they're they're definitely i think they're books that you read at that age are so formative um which is part of why it's so exciting to write kids books i can re i remember them really well and i think especially in peter pan i remember loving the way that the stars kind of interact with the the characters there's like a star always whispering to Peter, like, quick, get away. They're like characters. Um, and I've got an element of that in my book. So, yeah, I've stolen that. Apparently, the first Harry Potter novel came out in 1997, according to Movie Man. Hmm. That sounds about right. I think I would have been 12. So maybe, actually, that was a, probably the right age for me to start reading Harry Potter. I didn't read it. I'm thinking say, younger. You? Huh? I was going to say, you, you're sounding like someone who didn't read them. No, I didn't. I, do you know what? I wasn't much of a reader when I was a kid. And then I don't know why. I just I just wasn't. And weirdly, I was really good at English language and literature, but I just hated reading. And then when I... I know, it's weird, isn't it? really gifted without doing any work. I was just incredibly gifted. No, but I um I decided to, yeah, just not bother with that kind of stuff. And I, I, I actually wasn't really interested. And I'm still... I don't know if I am or not. That's why I had so many questions about no but i i as in like sort of fancy world stuff i just, i don't know why it's the same with um a lot of like tv stuff like star wars and things like that like made up worlds even watching lord of the rings which i know obviously is the adaptation of the books but i just can't i can't get into that stuff i really love factual like books which is why now oh, you're one of as an adult i i read a, quite a lot but the books i read are basically factual books with statistics and That's they are okay. still books. <laughs> yeah that i mean they're so fucking boring i'm really good at boring people about books i'm reading i could just sort of say yeah i'm reading this book and it's really fucking boring i'm going to tell you about it for the next hour or whatever um but that's why i think i was so intrigued about how you can sort of create this fantasy world and enter into it and write in that space i mean if you like we were saying earlier on about what you can get away with in terms of when, when you're writing in that if the talking carrot we'll go back to but if you're se if you're I'm setting that, Ollie. the next book is going to be called the talking carrot just i want i want i want some of the proceeds of that book because it will do so <laughs> fucking well <laughs> but the the um if you if you set rules do you, i mean you, you've you've like you were saying you take away gravity if you set rules how do you adhere to them do you not worry about going into the second book or the third book you'll be like shit because you you know fans of your book when they get into it will know it intimately and if you make a mistake or go for, i'm I, you haven't even had it published yet i'm putting the shit up yeah, right. yeah but they will they'll yeah. they'll say well you've got you've got um you know you've you've you said this in the last book and you haven't followed it through yeah, uh, I mean, I'd be really excited if someone had studied it hard enough to know that, first of all. I'd be like, ooh, well done you. <laughs> Nerd. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lisa. <laughs> no, I would not. I'd be so, I'd be so flattered. Uh, uh, I guess, I think my book does, having said that maybe you have to think of rules, my book doesn't have a lot of rules. It's more about the creatures uh, that you meet. But I suppose they do have to be, there's a level of consistency. Um, I don't know. That, I, yeah, I think because it's more about animals and made up creatures, they're characters. So if I reread bits of book one, it reminds me what they're like. So I can write them for book two. But like I said, I edit them a lot. I write. I write them doing the wrong thing and then I'm like, oh no, that's not what they do. And I have to rewrite it several times until eventually I find, oh, that's what they do. So it always feels like a process of trial and error for me. Uh, and if I find it believable, then I will keep it. But I do enjoy those kind of books. And I think if you don't enjoy reading those kind of books, it might be difficult to write one. 
if do you write in the way that I'm sort of asking these questions that are sort of flip flopping between <laughs> all over the place? Do you or do you sort of do you do it in a very linear fashion? Start at the beginning, finish at the end, or will you go? Mm, I'm going to write this middle bit. I've got, I've got ch- chapter eight. I'm going to focus on today. Or do, do you have anything like that that, that you do slightly differently? Uh, I end up writing. I okay, it's kind of roughly linear, but I end up writing it a bit in patchwork. Uh, and I like to imagine it's like an amazing patchwork quilt, and then I'll stitch it together at the end. Uh, and it's not really like that at all. It's like dribs and drabs of word documents all over the place. Um, but I find it helps to try and, or in finding it helps to try and write something that I'm excited about. It's quite hard to write a scene if I'm like, oh, that's boring. Um, so if I can think of a scene that's coming up, even if it's quite far ahead, I'm like, oh yeah, that'll be quite scary or that'll be quite fun. And I can make myself motivated to write it. Uh, and then I do try to sort of puzzle them together at the end. So I'm excited. Yeah, that's about it. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. I just imagine that being incredibly difficult to do. Um, just a few questions coming in as well. Um, oh, Mini Hood's asking if it's just fantasy worlds I don't like or fiction in general. Uh, mostly fantasy worlds, but I don't really, I don't read a lot of fiction. And Movie Man, basically touching on what we've kind of spoken spoken about, which is, do you know the ending before you begin? Actually, no, I haven't really asked. Yeah, I mean, yes, if you're piecing it together, do you know Do you know where you're going? Do you know where that ends? Do you know the end of book two, basically? Do you know the end of book three? Yeah, I know roughly what I would like to get to. Definitely. I've heard loads of other authors when I listen to podcasts of other people talking about writing who seem to know what they're talking about. They say that it's like a, I think a really common way of thinking of it is like a road map and you're you know where you've got to get to B, you know what B looks like because you've got it on the map and then you're only seeing as far ahead of you as the car headlights will allow you to see so you're kind of discovering it as you go along which feels like a, a nice analogy no it kind, of, it, it kind of makes sense weirdly in broadcasting it's kind of the same um okay. they, they say it with links so if you're going in the link in broadcasting you don't know where you're going you'll just end up floundering about and it'll sound shit and then you'll hit Sinead O'Connor and then that's it do you know what I mean <laughs> so you got to like you got to have somewhere a good thing or a bad thing no as in you'll just play it randomly after fumbling <laughs> okay. about and just go oh fuck Sinead O'Connor uh but um whereas actually what you want is a, a, a nice clean finish so you know you sort of that that feels like an established end so i can imagine it being the same but it was certainly what at school when we were in english language we sort of were told to do that if you're writing sort of it's quite a good idea to have the end first i remember sort of being asked that um i want to touch on something difference with broadcasting though is you've got to do it all live whereas that's why it's that the editing is is how you can trick everyone because hopefully it reads like it's been written quite spontaneously but obviously you've you've had the chance to go back and fix it all so you can write a load of crap uh and i do (laughs) and then go back and slowly slowly make it seem a bit less crap which is where i think i would really struggle with broadcasting because i feel like well no well that's kind of okay because the thing with broadcasting is you 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 say something on the radio and then it's gone that's it it's disposable you know it's mm-hmm. it's it's the first draft and it's out there so it doesn't really matter whereas i think you know with your book you can go over it and pour over it again and again in real time so a sentence if it's not crafted properly somebody can just go back over it then and go what whereas if i say something they'll go did he just fumble that Ah, oh, who cares? Oh, Here's Sinead Sinead O'Connor. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't really matter. So I think, um, yeah, no, it's it's interesting, but that that that's the art, isn't it? Like that's the when you were talking about like piecing it together, figuring out how to do that without it appearing shit and looking like they're they're all written at completely different times. Because I I feel like I have a writing style, but I think if I actually took everything I've written over the last two years and sort of stuck it together, it'd be like what <laughs> this is different you know it's a different person do you know what i mean i just that must be quite difficult to sort of tie them together in that way yeah it oh i've forgotten what the word for it is now the bits that link up different scenes i think is i i definitely find that really difficult uh i wish somebody else would come and and write those bits for me 
simple question coming in and then i just want to touch on one thing before we finish up uh what is fran's favorite novel have we uh or ask a recent one if too hard to choose have i asked you that i asked uh, you what you're inspired by not your favorite yeah your favorite novel even if it's just oh, now all the time uh, actually i've got two questions two questions what are you reading at the moment at the moment i'm reading underland which is non-fiction as you say you like um yeah. What's which that about? i don't normally read what is it give me give me the give me the synopsis um i will never do it justice but it's by robert mcfarlane who is a nature writer and it mm. it sounds really boring saying you've written a book about the underground because it feels like what is that underground worth looking at but it is it's amazing he goes i think he's a climber but he has done a lot of caving and climbing underground whatever the proper word for that is to write this book he's done about 10 years of research on it and he's written about all the things we put underground trying to hide them like nuclear waste and the scientific facilities they've got trying to what was it looking at dark matter and that kind of stuff but oh, wow. then also going back to prehistoric times and how people were buried and there's also a huge apparently you might already have known this but apparently there's a huge community of people who like break into abandoned mines and that kind of thing it's yes i did know that yeah and they That's film it and they post it on uh they post it on YouTube and bits like that. Yeah, but it's a, he's an amazing writer. I love him. He writes um, non-fiction like it's poetry. I don't know how he does that. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, you've kind of hit on a little bit why I love it so much. It's just that you take something that so, seems so dull, the underground, and then you're just, you, you open up this new world that you had no idea of, and it's real. Um, mm -hmm. I do. The thing is, though, the thing with it, I do completely understand and get the escapism of magical fantasy worlds. I get. I fucking love The Simpsons. All right, I fucking love it. It's a made-up world with yellow what? characters, <laughs> and so I love that. But you know what I mean? It's just I, I. I don't know. I think it's the magic stuff, which is awful, isn't it? It's like, no, it's like, you don't have to love fantasy books. That's all right. <laughs> um. Right. Yes, before we finish up, I just wanted to ask you one more question. And, and uh, I'm not asking for a direct answer on this because I think that's really unfair. Um, money, when you sign a book deal, how does that work and how do they support you? And is it enough? Is it good? I'm really lucky. So I think because I'm signed by HarperCollins, one of the bigger publishers, I think I've got a better money deal than most debut authors get. Um, but I got an agent, so shortly after I went to meet my editor in London, I thought, ooh, they're actually offering me a deal. I should probably find someone who knows how to negotiate this. Uh, and the agent was really helpful um, for getting more money. Um, but it's even though I have, I'm really lucky, I still do freelance copywriting to top up the money from author, the author pot. Oh, so it's not like a, you, okay. Okay. No, I'm that's interesting. Well, no, I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think a lot of people that might want to sort of write a book, I suppose, unless you become a hit number one bestseller, it's not going to pay for that extension, is it? Do you know what I mean? It's Yeah, definitely. I've definitely taken a big pay cut quitting my job to write. Uh, but I am also aware that I'm massively lucky compared to a lot of people published by smaller publishers. It's, it's a problem, I think. Uh, that people can't afford to live off it. That's not good and kind of makes it more available to the middle classes than anyone else. Well, it's, it seems, un yeah, that's 100%. I mean, that seems completely unsustainable. It's kind of why I wanted to ask you about it. I think that, have you not, I mean, even your agent sort of like helping you bump that up a bit, weren't you a bit like, oh, well, I can, I still have to work to make this happen for me. It, can't you get more? <laughs> Yeah, I guess I, I'm never, I don't know if anyone ever writes a book for the money. And if they are, that's probably a bad sign. So I never, I never thought like I was going to become rich from it. It's, uh, feel really grateful that I was able to quit my job and top it up with freelance work. Um, and I had another career beforehand, so I'm able to do that, but. I think it's a, a bigger problem that people publish by smaller publishing. Again, I'm new to the industry, so I, I don't 100% know, but I think the average book deal is something like £10,000. Oh, really? 
Yeah, um, so even if it hasn't taken you eight years to write that, if you work it out on an um, hourly basis, you're definitely below minimum wage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's true. Th thanks for answering that question. Thank you, because it's difficult to answer sometimes. Um, and then just to finish up, because we're going to go, what... What have you What have you learned from this process? If you're going to go and write another book, which you have to because you are contracted to do so, but I mean beyond beyond the trilogy, what what lessons going through this process have you learned that you'll take into your next your next book, next series, or whatever you end up doing? Ah, uh, feedback. <laughs> I need feedback. Um, it's a tricky one. I think because I'm struggling with book two at the moment, I don't feel full of lessons. Once I finish book two, hopefully that future Fran will have some advice for myself. But I found reading, having the writers group really helpful, having people to give feedback and read it out loud to makes it seem more real and keeps you sort of like a mini deadline because I have writers group every fortnight. So it's like, oh, I must have something ready and edited for writers group. Um, but yeah, probably I suspect the biggest trick is to have a break and not try to write all the time. But um, like I said, I'm I'm working on that. Yeah, it's, it, it will come with time. It will come with time. Um, Minnie Hood's asked what the book is called. The book is called A Clock of Stars, The Shadow Moth. There is a link uh, just further up in the chat. You can check it out. Uh, and it is available when? 1st of October. 1st of October in all your favourite bookstores. I hope. Well, with Waterstones have got it on there. Waterstones or Waterstones? What are we going for? Waterstones? Yeah, I said Waterstones. Waterstones. That's, that's completely wrong, isn't it? Did I mention I was good at English language? Yeah. <laughs> well, look, um, thanks very much for taking the time to chat to me. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's lovely talking to you again and seeing you again. Best of luck with book two and the book Thanks. launch Thanks, um, it's been really good yeah it's been brilliant and i genuinely i can't wait to see the book can't wait to read it and i even no, though i hate magic i know you hate no, fantasy no i hate <laughs> fantasy i i will make a point i hate fantasy magic books i will make a point of reading your book and i'll make a point of buying it and i mean you that it. illustrations how yes i'm gonna look at all the pictures and yeah, every time you've read it Yes. Okay. I will. Thanks very much. Thanks, I will Wally. see you soon. Um, thanks very much for watching, everybody. I really appreciate it. I will be back on Friday with Ade Bangbala. It's going to be something you don't want to miss. Trust me, he's a really interesting chap. So uh, make sure you tune in on Friday. Have a lovely afternoon, and I will see you soon. Goodbye.